Thank you. you. May be seated. Again, it's a great privilege to welcome to our pulpit uh, Brother Ken Olson, a uh, missionary to Brazil, one who has served the Lord for many years, not only there but also in Cameroon. And so, Brother Olson, without further ado, welcome back. Well, as I think I've said before here in this church, that uh, I really appreciate singing the hymns, the hymn, hymn sing on Sunday night, and that's refreshing down in Brazil uh, hymns are a little bit rare down there not that many people, churches sing them anymore uh, most of them sing the modern choruses and contemporary music with their worship teams and all that uh, but uh, the old hymns are the ones that really have some meat to the words yeah there's it's true that there's a few good new contemporary songs uh, two or three of them but you know, there aren't too many, and most of them are just blind repetition, mindless repetition, repetition of the same words over and over again, and they're like a love song uh, you're singing, and, uh, oh, Jesus, I want to smell your perfume, Jesus, I want more of you, and things like that. It's, uh, the message is nothing compared to the messages of the old hymns. And uh, so praise the Lord for the old hymns. Of course, it's just a, another sign of the apostasy of the times, that people want to get rid of the, rid of the uh, sound old hymns, and they want to have a, uh, the frothy uh, modern stuff that has very little message to it at all. Well, anyway, here we have Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 2, we're going to start with the end of chapter 2. Ezekiel chapter 2 and verse 9. Ezekiel chapter 2 and verse 9. Ezekiel for today, part 2 tonight. We had part 1 this morning. And there's no new thing under the sun. That which has been will be, and that which will be has been. As Solomon so wisely said before. And the things in the book of Ezekiel are the same things that are going on in the world around us today. In the church around us today is just like Israel of Ezekiel's time. Here we have Ezekiel chapter 2 and verse 9. And when I looked, behold, a hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was written, was therein. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without. And there, were writ and there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest, eat this roll, and go and speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill, all thy, fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. Well, let's bow in prayer. O oh Lord, we thank thee for this opportunity that we have tonight to study thy word. We pray that thou would open up the book of Ezekiel to us once again this evening and help us to uh, learn things from it that we might be able to use in our lives today in the 21st century. And O oh Lord, we thank thee that thy word is so clear, that thy word uh, penetrates into the darkness. And O oh Lord, help us to look to thy word always for guidance. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, here we have Ezekiel. He was told to eat the roll of a book. Of course, back in those days, they had scrolls, not codexes as we have today. But they had scrolls, and he was given this scroll, and he was told to eat it. And this is very much reminiscent of the book of Revelation, where we have John in the book of Revelation told to eat a roll, a book there. And in the book of Revelation, it's very much the same roll. Now uh, here we're told that in that roll was written, verse 10, Lamentations and mourning and woe. Uh, this book is written with all these uh, calamities that will happen upon the earth, all these judgments of God, and Ezekiel was told to take these things in and to eat of them. And of course, again, as we said this morning, the evil things, the calamities, the catastrophes that happen on this earth, well, God uses those things to bring people unto himself. And uh, that's what God has always used and he continues to use. And so here we have Ezekiel. He reads. Uh, he takes this roll. He eats it. 
And we're told that it was in his mouth as honey for sweetness. As honey for sweetness. And in the book of Revelation, John, when he wrote, ate the wool, uh, it was in, as honey for sweetness in his mouth, but then in his belly it became bitter. And uh, I think that's because, uh, you know, we, we keep saying to the Lord, O Lord, how long, O Lord, holy and true, as the martyrs in the book of Revelation, and how long will it be ere the mystery of iniquity is finished in this world? How long will it be that God will judge the sin of this world, that God will set things right, that he will take control of this earth? Well, uh, it's sweetness in Ezekiel's mouth because God is finally going to take control. He's finally going to judge sin and uh, give people their just desserts uh, before him. But the problem is, is after all those calamities and judgments of God fall, well, it's, he gets second thoughts about that, especially in the book of Revelation with John, and it becomes bitter in his belly. Well, you know, there's always a price to pay for sin. Always. And you know, God's judgment always falls upon sin. And that's why we have all the trouble and evil and disease and death and famine and all the different things that we have in the world is as a result of sin, as a result of the fall of man. And you know, nobody can keep on going all their life and uh, uh, keep on going and escape the results of sin. No one can do that, even though they seem to do it. And uh, you know, I always think of the illustration over in Russia of Molotov. Uh, you know, they named the Molotov cocktails after Molotov, the foreign minister there of, of Soviet Russia under Stalin. And he was a very ruthless man. He didn't mind killing uh, thousands of people. He didn't mind uh, doing, doing Stalin's bidding. And so they named the Molotov cocktails after him. But you know, he died in peace in his bed at 95 years old. And, uh, well, did God judge sin with him? Well, God never judged sin with him on this earth, but he is paying for his sin today. I think we can rest pretty well assured of that, uh, that he's paying for it today and in eternity. If we don't pay for it on this earth, we'll pay for it in, ter in eternity. You know, I also had another illustration just like that over in Cameroon when I was just over there. And uh, I stayed with a couple of missionaries there, and uh, one missionary lady there, she was telling me about her mother and her father. And she told me that her father was a very godly man, and her mother was a very wicked woman. But the only thing is, her mother went to church. And her mother uh, seemed to be a Christian to people outside of her home. And she, she looked like a Christian. She even helped missionaries, supported missionaries, sent missionary packages out, went to a good church. And yet that lady there that I was talking to had no doubt in her mind that her mother was unsaved and that she was a wicked woman. And in fact, she told me that when her mother died, she was away, and when she got back, she came to see her father, and she asked her father, well, did mother repent? Did mother get right with the Lord at the very end there? And she was 95 years old, by the way, at the end. She was 95 years old, never had any great sickness, never anything like that. Well, she asked her father, did, uh, did she repent at the end? And her father's answer was, she's in hell right now. And, you know, that's quite a positive, uh, concrete statement there. And, uh, you know, I think we can say that at times. If we uh, have plenty of fruits to inspect, the Bible says that by their fruits ye shall know them. And, of course, that's a really interesting illustration, again, uh, that, you know, we can look like a Christian, but we might not be one. And we've got to look at our own hearts and see if we're really living for the Lord, if we're really sincerely following Him. And that's also another illustration of the fact that maybe sometimes people don't get their just desserts on this earth. Many times the wicked, wicked prosper. But in the end, in eternity, there will be lamentations and mourning and woe upon sin. But many times here on this earth as well. Well, then we go on to verse 4. Verse 4. And He said unto me, Son of man... 
Go get thee unto the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. So here we have Ezekiel, he's given his commission, and his commission is to speak God's word unto the land of Israel. What's our commission today? Our commission today is the very same great commission to go out and speak God's word to the world around us. Speak with my words unto them. And you know, too often today in churches, people like to say things that are very logical and make good sense humanly speaking, but they're really not according to God's word. We have to make sure that everything we're speaking, everything we're teaching and believing is according to God's word in the Bible. And you know, I think of one example of this. In Brazil recently, my wife was in a class down there, a women's class, and they went on and on in the class about witnessing the Jehovah's Witnesses. And of course, the Jehovah's Witnesses are very strong down there. We pass the Jehovah's Witness Kingdom Hall on our way to uh, wherever we go, actually. It's right on our road there. And uh, they're always out on the road, knocking on doors. And uh, so the people in the class were talking about witnessing the Jehovah's Witnesses and about uh, what should we do. Well, they very logically said, well, you know, we have to try to bring them to the Lord. And we have to do everything we can to bring them to the Lord. And we need to invite them into our house when they come. And we need to hear their spiel. And then after they give us their spiel, we need to give them a gospel presentation and give them the gospel. And we need to, uh, you know, treat them nicely and, uh, and try to win them to the Lord. Well, you know, that all makes sense, humanly speaking and logically speaking. But, you know, that's not what the Bible says. You know, the Bible in 2 John, John says, If any comes unto you bearing not this doctrine that Jesus is God, that, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, that he is God, what are we supposed to do? We're not supposed to invite them into our house. Don't invite them into your home, neither bid them God's speed. For he that biddeth them God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. And, you know, uh, uh, we can look at logic and say, oh, hey, we've got to treat them nice and, uh, and try to win them over. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that if they're bringing damnable doctrines around, we're not supposed to, to give them the right hand of fellowship. We're not supposed to invite them into our house. I mean, we can say a few things to them. We can uh, try to tell them that Jesus is Lord. We can say that the thief, thief on the cross, uh, you know, look to Jesus, that uh, Thomas said, my Lord and my God, and things like that. We can tell them a few things, uh, but we, don't, we can't be inviting them in and treating them really well with those damnable doctrines that they have. And they have the exact doctrines that are talked about in 2 John. So anyway, here we have, Speak with my words unto them. Verse 4 with Ezekiel. And then verse 5, For thou art not sent to a people of a strange speech, and of an hard language, but to the house of Israel. And so here Ezekiel, he was given his commission to go to the house of Israel, to go to those that called themselves Christians. Now, all these people in Ezekiel's time, they all said, well, hey, we're Jews, we're God's chosen people. Well, they really weren't God's people, as we see very clearly from the book of Ezekiel. The, the vast majority of them were not God's people. You know, by the way, Ezekiel here, he talks in very blanket terms about the nation of Israel that they're all bad, they're all gone out of the way. Do you think there were just a couple in Israel that were good? Well, I think there probably were a couple in Israel that were good, a few. But, by and large, the vast, vast majority were exactly as Ezekiel was describing them. And sometimes I'm faulted in my talking about Brazil. And sometimes I'm told, well, aren't there any good Christians down there? Well, yeah, there are some good Christians down there. But the vast, vast majority is just like in the Ezekiel. And of course, I talk about the United States in the same terms that I talk about Brazil, that the vast majority is going astray. And so here we have Ezekiel talking to the house of Israel, the people that claim to be Christians, claim to be Jews, and yet they really weren't God's real people. Now we have verse 6, not too many people of a strange speech and of a hard language, whose words thou canst not understand, surely had I sent thee to them, they would have hearkened unto thee. Now here's an interesting verse here. 
The, uh, Ezekiel is told that he was not sent to a foreign country. And he says that had he be, been sent to a foreign country to preach, the people would have repented and they would have turned to the Lord. Well, then uh, why didn't the Lord send Ezekiel to the foreign country so that the people would repent and turn to the Lord? Well, I think here we have a very good uh, scripture passage of election, of Calvinism, uh, that God chooses to save whom he will. Of course, uh, we as Christians, we give the, the gospel message to whosoever will, to everyone. But God does choose certain ones to open up their hearts to respond to the gospel message and give them a new heart. And so here God, he sends Ezekiel to a nation that won't listen. And God says here right in this verse that if, if he had gone somewhere else, they would have hearkened unto Ezekiel. Then verse 7, But the house of Israel will not hearken unto thee, for they will not hearken unto me. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. Well, what kind of results was Ezekiel promised there in Israel? He was promised to have no results, no positive results. He said, The house of Israel will not hearken unto thee. You know, so often in the church today and in the world around us, things are judged by results. If you have good results with something, then you need to do that. And if you don't have good results with it, well, then you don't do that. And people judge things in that manner. But you know, we can't judge things by results. And Ezekiel was there doing exactly what God wanted him to do, in exactly the manner that God wanted him to do it, and yet he had zero results. And that was all according to the providence of God, according to what God wanted to have happen. The house of Israel will not hearken unto thee. And you know, we see that in Brazil, also in the United States today. The churches, they set up their worship services. They do things in the church according to what they think they're going to have results with. And in Brazil, it's, it's a little worse than here in the United States. And the, they want to have all the churches contemporary. And they want to have all the contemporary music. They want to have the guitars, the drum sets. You know, instead of pulpits in the middle of the church, this is, this is good churches we're talking about, the best ones. And sometimes instead of a pulpit in the middle, they have the drum set there. And, you know, they do that because they say, well, we want to attract the young people into the church. And unless we do this, we won't get the young people into the church. Well, you know, they're judging things by results, and maybe they might get some rock and roll young people into the church. But you know, uh, that's not how we judge things. We judge things by God's Word. We judge things by God's Word. Is something reverent? Is something good for worship? Is something according to God's Word? Is something not of the world? And... That's how we should judge things. Well, here we are. The house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. Well, we see that around us today. Here in America, how many people took a cue from the earthquake and the hurricane? Probably very few uh, turned to God through that. Because people are impudent and hard-hearted. Uh, when it talks about hard-hearted like this, I, I think of the ones in Sodom and Gomorrah. And in Sodom and Gomorrah there, with Lot there, when the homosexuals were trying to get into Lot's house, they were stricken blind. And what did they do after they were stricken blind? Did they go back home? No, they wearied themselves still trying to get in at the door. They didn't learn the lesson, even when they were stricken blind. They were impudent and hard-hearted. And that's what we have today. And of course, all of us are somewhat impudent and hard-hearted for that matter. But by the grace of God, we can have a soft heart and turn to the Lord. Well, then we have verse 8. Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces, and thy forehead strong against their foreheads. Well, this is interesting. It has a word against there. Against their faces. Against their foreheads. 
So as Ezekiel goes out and he preaches the word of God, he gives them God's word, are the people going to receive it? Of course, we already know they won't. And they're not going to be liking what Ezekiel tells them. And they're going to be uh, fighting against Ezekiel. And Ezekiel is, has to be strong against them. Ezekiel is not going to be very popular preaching God's word. What about today in America? Will you be popular, really being strong in God's word and preaching God's word? No, you won't. And, uh, you know, I really think that if anyone in America today or in Brazil today is very popular, there's likely to be a problem with them. Because, you see, the world around us here is not a, a world that's friendly to the things of the Lord. The church today is not friendly to the things of the Lord. And it is a day when people will not endure sound doctrine. And so, if somebody is very popular, there's likely to be a problem with them. And uh, here we have Ezekiel. He was not popular, and people were fighting against him. Verse 9, As an adamant, harder than flint, have I made thy forehead. Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. His forehead is being made hard as a rock. And you know he's going to have people giving him bad looks. They're going to be fighting against him, plotting against him. But God here says he's going to make Ezekiel strong to give out God's word. And here, as far as we know, Ezekiel, he's all by himself. All by himself giving out God's word. And you know that's how it is so often through history. Just a very few uh, really serving God. And that's what we have with Ezekiel, and that's what we have today in America and Brazil. Be not dismayed at their looks. They're going to give him some bad looks. They're going to think he's a religious fanatic, and though they be a rebellious house. And then verse 10. Moreover he said unto me, Son of man, all my words that I shall speak unto thee, receive in thine heart, and hear with thine ears, and go, get thee to them of the captivity, and to the children of thy people, and speak unto them. So Ezekiel, he was to get God's word. He was supposed to hear God's word. He was to receive it in his heart. And then he was supposed to go and speak unto the children of Israel. When I was in Cameroon this past week, uh, we went to a, a store to buy Bibles, a Bible society there, and they had a poster on the wall there that was pretty interesting. And the, the poster said, it's not enough to have a Bible. You have to read it. And then it said it's not enough to read the Bible. You have to believe it. And then it said it's not enough to believe what you read in the Bible, but we have to go out and practice it and put it into practice. And that's what we need to do, and that's what Ezekiel was told to do right here. Hear, receive, go, and tell the children of Israel. And what was he supposed to tell them? He was supposed to tell them, Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. And that's our job today. To say, Thus saith the Lord. And from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, the devil has said the contra contrary of that. He has said, Yea, hath God said. But we are supposed to go out and say, Thus saith the Lord. And what we read in our Bible, what we study out of the Bible. Whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. And of course, Ezekiel was promised that they would forbear. That they wouldn't listen to him. We aren't exactly promised that today. Uh, but we can see in the world around us that we're not likely to have a whole lot of results today. With the state of apostasy today. Whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. Well, what good does it do to preach to people that don't want to listen and don't listen at all? What good does it do? Well, it makes those people completely accountable. And I think uh, probably in the day of judgment, uh, God is going to say to them, so-and-so came to you on December 8, 1994, with God's word, and you rejected it. And they will be without excuse. Well, let me go, on, go down to verse 16. Down to verse 16. 
And it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth, and give them warning for me. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, not, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet, if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wicked wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. And you know, uh, that sounds like something we read this morning, doesn't it? It sounds exactly the same. And you know, it is exactly the same as over in Ezekiel chapter 33. And why would the Bible have two passages with exactly the same thing? Well, they have two passages with exactly the same thing for emphasis, to show us that this is important. And when the Bible repeats things, it's for emphasis. And it is important for us to be a watchman, just as it was important for Ezekiel to be a watchman, to give warning to the world from the Lord. And God requires us to be watchmen. God requires us to be soldiers. You know, we're soldiers in a battle today. Uh, when I was in Brazil, I was talking to somebody that had been associated with the ICCC in the past. I was talking to him, and he, he told me that he had even had Dr. McIntyre in his house in the past down there in Brazil. But he said, oh, you know, what did it ever profit to do all that fighting? All that fighting against evil, all that, uh, all that. You know, what we need to do is we just need to go out and preach the gospel, a positive gospel, to bring people unto the Lord. Well, you know, we do need to preach the gospel to bring people unto the Lord, but the Bible talks about that we're soldiers. Many times in the Bible, we're soldiers. We're in a fight, a fight for God's word and the defense of God's truth. And that's what we need to be as soldiers. And it, what does it profit? Well, we're doing the God's will, even if we're not successful. We're still being God's witness on this earth. And you know, we're not called on this life and this earth to, to a life of luxury, just sitting back and enjoying things. I hear Christians say, oh, well, God has prospered me and God given me all these things. I need to just sit back and enjoy them. Well, that's not the time we're in today. We're in a fight. We're in a battle. We're soldiers. And we need to be out in the battle. We need to be fighting for God's truth and giving warning as watchmen from the Lord. And you know, it is a losing battle today in this day, these days of apostasy. And we as premillennialists, we believe that uh, uh, things are going to go down and down until the time that Christ comes back. And you know, we still need to be fighting, we still need to be keeping on, even though there's not that much prospect of any great success. I remember back in World War II, uh, Winston Churchill, he was, he was, you know, urging the people of Britain to get behind the war and get behind the fight. And he was saying that, uh, you know, we need to get behind the fight against the Germans today, now. Because he said, there may come a day in the future when we will have to fight when there will be no chance of success. And you know, that's very true. And even when there's no chance of success, we will have to fight uh, for the Lord and for His truth. Well, here it says, His blood will I require at thine hand if we don't give out the gospel, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. And you know, we're responsible for other people. Back in the beginning in Genesis, Cain said, Am I my brother's keeper? Well, we are our brother's keeper. And we have a responsibility for other people around us. We have responsibilities for our next door neighbor, the people we work with, our relatives, uh, for people that we come in contact with. We have the responsibility to give them the gospel and to try to witness unto them. And you know what the most, the easiest way to witness is? is with tracts. That's the easiest way in the world to witness. And uh, I'm a firm believer in tracts. I know this church has been a firm believer in tracts in the past. They've had the king's messengers here. And uh, still today, or, uh, many believe firmly in tracts. And it's, they're the easiest way to witness. We can leave tracts around and we don't even have to talk to someone. 
and we can give the tracks them as a good way to open up a conversation. And we need to try to be witnesses for the Lord, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. And, you know, I was just uh, at the park just a few minutes before church, and I felt led when I was there to try to give a track to somebody there. Well, you know, the guy there, he, he, I didn't even have the track even out of my pocket yet, and he says, no, I'm good, uh, see you later. And, uh, of course, I think he had seen me with my Bible a little bit earlier. I was studying for my sermon there. And, uh, you know, he didn't want to hear it. And, uh, you know, uh, what good did it do to try to give him a tract? What good did it do to try to witness to him? Well, it was a good thing to do whether he heard or whether he would forbear. And, uh, you know, he, he will be held accountable for that in the end. And uh, so we need to try to be a witness for the Lord. And that's what God tells us to do. We're required to do that. But you know what goes on here? Verse 19, or verse 20. Again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness which he hath done shall not be remembered. But his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned. Also thou hast delivered thy soul. And so we're not only supposed to warn the wicked, the unsaved, about heaven and hell and judgment of God, but we're also supposed to warn saved people, righteous people, and when they turn away from the right way, when they go into error, we're supposed to warn them as well as a watchman. And you know, that's a big part of our ministry down in Brazil. In Brazil, we're trying to warn the Christians down there against error. And you know, there's plenty of error in the world today, plenty of error in the church entering in. And we put out a newspaper there, we send it out over all of Brazil, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear and try to help them with the errors that are so rampant around us. And you know what's interesting here? In verse 21 it says, He shall surely live because he is warned. That is the means that God will save this elect person, save him in the right way. He will save him in the right way because he is warned. God uses that warning to turn him in the right way. And you know what's interesting in the book of Hebrews? In the book of Hebrews, there are a couple of passages there in the he book of Hebrews that the Arminians use against the Calvinists. And there in Hebrews, it talks about a, a saved person. It says, if a saved person falls away, it is impossible to renew him again. And the Arminian will say, oh, well, see there, it, it teaches that a righteous, a saved person can fall away. Well, you know, I don't believe it's really teaching that. What it is, it's a warning. It's a warning. It's a warning that if you, if you, you saved person, if you fall away, you won't be able to be renewed again. And so that warning will keep the saved person from falling away. It's what God uses, that warning, even though there's no possibility that the saved person will fall away, because God will keep him from that, and God will use the warning to keep him in the right way. It's just like in the book of Acts, we have the shipwreck of Paul. And Paul is on the ship there, and he prophesies that no one will be lost from the shipwreck. No one will be lost. God has assured me. And then, a little bit after that, when the sailors try to get off the ship, Paul says, if the sailors get off the ship, you will not be saved. But there was no possibility that they would not be saved. But he said, if the sailors get off the ship, you won't be saved. But that warning about the sailors kept the sailors on the ship and kept them being saved uh, from the storm. And here we have these warnings here. To keep the saved people in the right way, we give them warning. Uh, to keep them away from error. And it's our job to be interested in others and have, take a responsibility for others. Well, down in Brazil, in our newspaper, we put out articles about worship. And, you know, worship is a big problem in the church today. 
And, uh, you know, we have churches in Brazil that, that no longer have the sign in front of the church saying worship service at 10 a.m. They have a sign saying celebration service at 10 a.m. Well, you know, you look at the Bible, and the Bible does talk a little bit about celebration. But, you know, celebration is not the same as worship. Those two things are not synonymous. And, you know, when people worship Christ, when the lepers came to worship Christ, at least the one leper came to worship Christ, did he jump around and celebrate? No, he fell down at Jesus' feet. And uniformly through the Bible, when people worshipped, they fell down at the feet to worship. They didn't jump around and celebrate. And uh, that's, uh, we have a lot of things like that, errors in the church today. And then we have errors in, in Brazil with the Bible. And, uh, of course, you just had the Dean Bergen Society conference here uh, with the King James Bible, and we have problems with the Bible here in the United States, but we have problems with the Bible in Brazil. And there's all the modern translations in Portuguese. Uh, but there are good translations in Portuguese, or one in particular. And so we put out articles comparing the different translations of the Bible there in Brazil to show them that the one translation is better than the other ones and translates from the original Greek and Hebrew right. And then we have articles on separation. And yes, separation is a very unpopular subject today, especially in Brazil. And the attitude is, is that everybody's right. I'm okay, you're okay. Everything goes. And uh, your church is good, my church is good. The watchword there is, the name of the church doesn't matter. They're all good. Well, that's not true. And so we try to tell them in our paper that that's not true, that not every church is good. And not anything goes. And you know, in God's Word, the Bible, we can see very clearly that not everything goes. That there is a right way and there is a wrong way. And so as, as we are Christians, as we are watchmen, we need to be concerned about our brethren, about the unsaved, about the saved. And be concerned and give them warning of error from the Lord. And then finally, we have verse 27 at the end of the chapter. But... When I speak with thee, I will open thy mouth, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, He that heareth, let him hear, and he that forbeareth, let him forbear, for they are a rebellious house. Well, today our job is a missionary job, to go out and give the gospel to those around us, to go out and give God's word to the people around us, to say, Thus saith the Lord. Let's bow in prayer. O oh Lord, we pray that Thou would bless these thoughts from Ezekiel to our hearts and help us to go out and say, Thus saith the Lord, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.